Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Keith. Well, oh, good night. There are too many people here I know. I can't pull anything over your eyes. Can't, oh, Mr. Mark God. Why don't you move back a few rows so I feel safer? Get back there by Mr. Long. If you, oh, it's, it's, it's a privilege to be here and have a chance to talk a little bit about uh, a kid who's had the chance to live his dream, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, the, the biographical sketch points out that I grew up on a farm in Indiana and dreamt of being on the radio, and that's, that's really true. I, I dreamt of being on the radio in Chicago. And the, part of that was I knew those guys were in air conditioning. <laughs> yeah, you get that if you were out on the field in the hot summer days, out there with that sun bearing down. And the radio station where I started had an International Harvester air conditioner. Believe it or not, International Harvester, you know, made, the, of course, countless tractors, combines, trucks. They made refrigerators, freezers. They made firearms for a while, didn't they, Dick? Uh, and they made air conditioners. And in the hot summer days, they're down there at WVMC 1360 on the dial, the voice and the choice of the Wabash Valley, where you could see the tower almost farther than you could hear the signal. On those hot August days, when the, when the disc jockey turned on the microphone, you could hear this, whoa, 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 and you knew he was getting ready to talk because that was the International Harvester air conditioner back there in the wall. Uh, every time he opened up that RCA microphone where you were getting ready to go on the air. I tell a couple of stories in the book. Uh, well, one of them is about a minister who had come out. I don't want to spoil this for you, but I would run that station on Sundays. The truth is I never missed a day of Sunday school until I started working in radio when I was in high school. Never missed a day. Radio was the beginning of the end for Max Armstrong, I guess somebody might say. That's where he started his slide down the slippery slope. But it was a great experience. I would sign the station on in the morning. And, uh, and I, I would see the ministers who would come out to do their church shows, and that they would be the only people I would see all day long were the ministers who would come out there. But what a great opportunity to learn radio, because you got to do everything. You, you signed the station on, you took news stories of somebody called in, you went out and you burned the trash at the end of the day after you put the station off the air. And I just uh, feel so fortunate. I, I say that this book really is, is my book of thanksgiving to some extent. I've been very, very blessed, very fortunate. Uh, to grow up in the family that I grew up in, uh, to grow up in the community where I grew up, the church family as well, and uh, to be able to, to do really what I wanted to do and combine two great worlds, two passions for me, radio and, and agriculture. And there aren't many places you can do that, and especially not many places in a big city in America. So I've been able to hang out with Orion. Well, if we, if we make it to Thanksgiving, it'll be 39 years that the two of us have worked together. And uh, I've, I've been, again, I should, should count him among my blessings, too, the, the opportunity to, to work with him and uh, learn from him and prop him up along the way. We were talking over dinner this evening about how much, you know, I, we never traveled together. Orion and I were very rarely on the road together. And they said, what, they are afraid for you, you two to be at the same place at the same time? No, I was in the Tribune Tower in Chicago while he was in Beijing or Tokyo, you know, you're one of those, those international capitals. Uh, but in reality, I've got to do a fair amount of traveling, too, and originate broadcast from some interesting destinations. Uh, Yugoslavia, when it was communist. Algeria, when it wasn't very safe. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, they had a considerable amount of mayhem that started after we were there in the early 90s. In fact, I think about 70,000 people were killed in some of the terrorist attacks in Algeria. What were we doing there? Well, there was an agriculture story. Almost everywhere you go in the world, you can find a good agriculture story, either from countries that produce for us or countries that buy from us. And that's why we were there in Algeria. Actually, the story behind that was that the Algerians were instrumental in helping free the Iranian hostages back in the early 80s. And so to reward the Algerians for their intervention in that particular event, uh, the U.S. government said, let's do some things for them. One of those was to build a demonstration farm out on the edge of the desert to show them how to produce their own meat, milk, and eggs and to do it better. It was a colossal failure. It just flopped because there wasn't that incentive, there wasn't that desire 
uh, that work ethic to make it work. And he, we went out and saw this thing, and it was just, a, it was sitting there, beautiful operation, state of the art for that time. And we learned later, it just sat out there on the edge of the desert and started to disintegrate because they didn't know how to do what needed to be done there, or didn't have the work ethic and the motivation to make things happen. So yeah, we've been to a lot of interesting places. There's a story in the book about our television camera that got stolen down in uh, South America. It was missing for a few minutes, so we got it back, and we wound up uh, on a Saturday night at the police station in the city of Foz de Iguazu. It's a very interesting location. It has the longest waterfall in the world right there on the Brazilian-Paraguay border. But again, we were down there covering the agriculture story because Brazil, of course, is the biggest competitor we have in soybeans now. That wasn't always the case, many of you will recall. Back before we started the embargoes in the 70s, we owned the global market of soybeans. They came to, everybody came to the United States for beans. And then we embargoed shipments. And we proved then we were not a reliable supplier. The Japanese said, we can't have this. We're so dependent upon the United States we have to have beans from somebody, so they invested mightily in the Southern Hemisphere. And now you have that massive land mass down there where Brazilian beans come out, Argentinian soybeans come out of there to compete with us in the world marketplace. And we're not the only game in town. Actually, we are right now for a few months because their production was cut about 25% in Argentina this spring due to flooding. It's helped us immensely. Our soybean market wouldn't be where it is right now were it not for the fact that they lost significant production in late spring floods down there. But there's a reminder in this whole thing that we cannot stop trade. We're so dependent upon trade. And this has been a lot of the rhetoric that has come up in the presidential campaign. Some saber rattling from both sides, unfortunately, about doing something about our trade agreements breaking off the trade agreements that we have. Well, it would be foolhardy to do so because 96% of the world's population lives outside of the United States. To think that we can cut off trade with those nations and just become an island, we can't do it. We'd run a huge part of our agriculture industry out of business because we produce far more than we can consume in the U.S. And that population is going to continue to grow. 7.3 billion people in the world today. China, of course, has the highest population, but guess what? India is going to surpass them. India is not far behind them now, and they'll become a big consumer of, of what we have to sell to the world as well. But we need the export markets. Many of the industrial companies in the United States need to be exporting into the world too. I know there's a lot of concern about jobs that have been exported south of the border. That gets into the whole trade debate. But we, in agriculture, and that means a lot of people in rural communities who are supported by agriculture, people who build combines. You know, Deere and companies laid off 2,000 people over the past few months simply because the agriculture economy is soft. There's so many jobs off the farm that depend on farmers now. And trade is a very important component of all of that happening. I think I've covered 13 secretaries of agriculture, and there's one story that's not in the book that I'll share with you. Some of you may remember the name of Earl Butts. I hear your laughter. Earl was Richard Nixon's secretary of agriculture. And Earl, <clears throat> let me put in perspective, first of all, what he did for U.S. agriculture. He said, in the midst of the whole Cold War, let's sell grain to the Soviet Union. Now think about that for just a minute. Many of us forget what the Cold War was all about and what was happening in that era. The Soviets had missiles aimed at us and we had missiles aimed at them. We got very close on a couple of occasions to a calamity. That massive nation that spanned across a dozen time zones dictated many aspects of American life in the late 50s, and through the 60s, even into the early 70s. So here's this guy. He'd been the dean of agriculture at Purdue who says, let's sell him grain. Let's feed our enemy. And it turned out for every bushel that we sold them, oh, hey, oh and by the way, he demanded cash on the barrel head. No credit for the purchases that they would make. 
And they bought, they bought in a big way from the United States, paying cash, paying cash that was not available to them then to invest in armaments. Now, the old Soviet Union fell apart a few years later, and uh, that credit usually goes elsewhere. But when you stop to think about it, old Earl may have started putting the first chinks in the wall to bring down the old USSR because they had less money to invest in armaments. So about six years before Earl died, we, he was at the Farm Progress Show, and he's sitting on the front row. I, I saw him sitting there waiting on Orion and the other guy who works with him to do this broadcast on stage. And he motioned to me with his cane. And I went over to him, and I said, Dr. Butts, uh, why are you carrying a cane? And he, he was kind of a, an irascible character. He had a lot of uh, quick lines that he would lay in there in a speech. And he said, I, I'm carrying this cane in case I see a Clinton Democrat. I'll hit him over the head with it. Yeah, Butts was a Republican appointee, of course. Then, before I could say anything else, he said, why is your hair so dark, kid? I said, what do you mean? He said, your hair shouldn't be that dark. Truth is, I was dyeing my hair at the time. I never did it again. Not after Earl Butts called me on it. I thought it would make me look younger or something. I don't know. But yeah, he was one of the 13 secretaries of agriculture that, uh, that I covered. That's an interesting, you know, there are some interesting stories there altogether, too. I mean, uh, we, uh, we had uh, Mike Espy, who was the first African-American secretary of agriculture. And he was followed by Dan Glickman, who was the first Jewish-American ag secretary. He used to, used to make jokes about being out on hog farms. You know, here you got a Jewish guy coming in who never touches the product that you produce. And uh, he was followed then by the first uh, female American agriculture secretary, Ann Veneman, from uh, California. The current ag secretary has had that job longer, I believe, longer than anybody in recent history. Uh, if, uh, if he serves all the way, if uh, Vil Walk, or, uh, 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 Vil Sack, I should say, serves all the way to the full term that uh, President Obama is there, he will have served all eight years. In fact, he's the only one in the cabinet to serve this uh, period of time. Vilsack was the former governor of Iowa, uh, and he, uh, he's been there for, for the whole thing. It's a very different U.S. Department of Agriculture these days. Not much of it deals with production agriculture and the people out on the farm. A lot of it deals with the food stamp program, the women, infants, and children's program, the school lunch program, grow your own garden program. In reality, that's a big part of his budget. 80% of what we call agriculture spending now, I want you to think about this for a minute. 80% of it is food stamps, school lunch program, women, infants, and children's program. There is talk, in fact, I know there was a plank in the Republican Party platform about separating the agriculture programs from these domestic feeding programs. And yeah, I, Bill, I see you shaking your head. It would be a terrible mistake because you'll never find the support for agriculture programs after that. There's a good reason they're tucked in there together, because you have so very few members of the House now who have any rural agriculture representation. Every senator has a farm constituency, but very few members of the House of Representatives have any farmers. To get legislation passed, ultimately you need the support of those guys like Danny Davis and, and those in the, in the metropolitan areas. And really, when you stop to think about it, a good, healthy agriculture program is in the best interest of all of us. But that's a hard thing to sell sometimes to folks, that good, sound ag policy is in our best interest for us to be well-fed. And, and here's a problem we're having right now, frankly. There's so much misinformation about food and how it should be grown and what shouldn't be done in food production. So much misinformation that is put out there by, by people peddling books. You can't trust them, for goodness sake. <laughs> but there are the TV chefs that are doing their thing, and they just throw a phrase out there, and people accept it as gospel, and much of it is not so. And if we start to make decisions on food policy that are not based on the science, we have to decide then of that $7.3 billion, which, by the way, is going to jump to $9 billion, by the year 2050, who's going to go without? I mean, we really need full-out production agriculture, full throttle, utilizing all of the science we can possibly utilize to achieve the level of production 
to feed all those people. I mean, we're adding 10,000 people an hour to the population of the earth. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 million a year being added to the population of the globe. Now think about that. It begs a lot of questions, doesn't it? Especially in this region, where are you going to put them? How will you fulfill their needs for water? How will you satisfy those bellies? So the, the farmer, with all of the challenges that he or she faces, uh, will have a great opportunity in the future. I'm excited about the young minds coming into agriculture, very frankly. And hopefully some of us with a little snow on the mountain will continue to encourage them. Uh, some of you might have the opportunity to mentor some of those people who have, are coming out of the ag schools and they've got the enthusiasm. They sure have the knowledge. And we need them. We need them as a part of the agriculture community. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to talk a long time because I'm programmed to 60 and 30 seconds. It doesn't take, doesn't take me long to do much of anything, you know. So I don't, I don't talk too long. Um, I've been so blessed uh, with family. I, 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 there's a chapter in there on mom and dad and a little bit of a story on how I found out my mom was packing a switchblade. Yeah, true story. She had a switchblade knife, which I didn't know until after she passed. Uh, and then, uh, then there was some stories about my dad. There's also a picture of my immediate family. Linda and I have been married since, uh, I better come up with this one fast, shouldn't I, Bonnie? I, I shouldn't falter on this one. Linda would find out so quickly, it'd be like putting it on the Associated Press when Bonnie hears that. 1981 is when Linda and I got married, and I've been so, so fortunate. Uh, I met her when I was working for the Illinois Farm Bureau. That was my first job out of college. I went to work in Bloomington, and then a couple of years later, had the chance to go to WGN, and have been uh, just uh, so blessed to, to be up there and still on there a little bit. And of course, privileged to be on the Milner radio stations here, the Valley and the River. I was just out at the studios as they stopped here today and uh, saw Mickey and Tim and uh, visited there for a little bit. And uh, so, yeah, I'm on about 150 local stations across the country every day on radio stations. Then Orion and I do our television show This Week in Agribusiness, which is carried on about 120 local stations. We're on three or four in California, nine in Texas. And they're spread out over the Corn Belt. And it runs also on RFD-TV. Some of you perhaps see the, the satellite programming. RFD-TV is a farmer and rancher channel. It's carried on Dish Network and Direct TV. Orion and I have been a part of that since uh, day one, actually, with the, the programming there. Any questions, any comments, any thoughts? Any slings and arrows? Yeah, we're coming up with another microphone here. If you, uh, I am so appreciative for Steve and Diane, who uh, helped make this all possible for me. Had they not drawn it out of me, because I think I turned them down a couple of times. I told Steve Levesack, I said, man, I don't have time for this. I, I, and I, plus, I have the attention span of a four-year-old anymore. I can't, I can't keep on track with this. But they were so kind to be uh, patient with me and to draw out some of the stories that, that are uh, in the book, Stories from the Heartland. And uh, they, they just took time with me, and finally we got it done. There is a story in there about my dad surviving the deadliest tornado in American history. And uh, that event kind of shaped my life. Well, thankfully, he survived. Uh, but he, he survived in a ditch as that big storm came through in 1925. His recollection of it, I, I always thought it was so foggy. I mean, he never saw a funnel cloud. Now, he was eight years old. But I, I would continually ask him. I would say, wasn't there a funnel cloud? Didn't you see something spinning? He said, no, it was just totally dark at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And he was consistent in his response, telling me that. So I mentioned this to Tommy Skilling. Many of you know Tom, of course, from Channel 9 and WGN Radio. And I, Tom started at WGN about six months after I did. In fact, I used to fill in for him. Yeah, I know. Think about that. <laughs> it was back in the days when they had the plexiglass wall. And he actually had an artist who would draw the fronts and the highs and the lows. So you'd give him this little map. Well, Tom was just getting into the electronic graphics. You know, he was, he was so into that stuff, and he's pioneered a lot of it, working with the weather graphics companies. And, and yeah, he's, I see you smiling. He's the genuine article. Tom gets so excited about weather. Well, he would ask me to fill in for him, and I, I filled in probably, I don't know, eight or ten nights a year for maybe eight years. And Roger Treemstra was 
on the air at the same time doing weather. And what happened was one of them was in the hospital and one was out of the country. I, I, I think Tom got sick at the time and Treemster was in Europe. And the television manager at WGN said, hey, hey, I, you know, we got to have somebody stand up there and do weather. Have you ever done weather? And I said, no, I took a class in college. Well, why don't you get in there and try it, kid? So, I, yeah. But Tommy was just getting into this computer stuff. And he'd say, oh, I'll leave you the instructions on a legal pad. Oh, yeah. It was chicken tracks. You would look at that and you'd say, what in the world does he mean? And I would ask the engineers, the WGN TV engineers, and they'd say, hey, pal, you're on your own. And part of that was it was outside of their union jurisdiction. And, you know, Tom, that was Tom's thing. And then they, I don't think they wanted to help me too much either. They just wanted to see me work my way through it, which I had to do. It would take about three and a half hours to prepare for about three minutes on the air. And finally, I, I, you know, when we moved to the radio studios downtown, I said, you know, I can't keep doing this and still you know, be married and have a family. So uh, I stopped working the weekends. And then, then that's when, uh, uh, you know, they started doing some other things in terms of the weather. But, yeah, Tom is so enthusiastic about the graphics. But I asked them about that 1925 funnel cloud. He said, you know, your dad probably never did see an actual spinning funnel. He said it probably was just a big black cloud in that uh, they called them F5s then. Now it would be an EF5, I guess, in the, the current enhanced Fujita scale or whatever they call it. But yeah, it, uh, it was interesting to verify that in, when I talked with Tom. And he's, uh, he's a genuine article. Tom is Jeffrey Skilling's brother. I don't know if you knew that or not. Jeffrey, who got into trouble in the Enron thing and is still in prison for it. And uh, Tom had uh, shared with me that obviously it was very tough on the family, very tough on his parents who are both now deceased uh, to have to endure something like that. Any questions about anybody in the uh, WGN family or anything we've done or any fun that we've had? Yes, sir. Did you uh, know uh, Trooper uh, Link Hampton? Did I know Trooper Link Hampton? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, yeah, Link, of course, was an Illinois State Trooper. And that was back in the day when we had police officers actually doing the traffic reports on WGN. When I got there, there was a Chicago police officer and a Cook County Sheriff's deputy, both in helicopters. And that evolved gradually, and then when we went to the studios downtown, to the showcase studio, there was the big map and the traffic reporter, whether it was Johnny Putman or whoever, would, would sit in there and do the reports. And Link Hampton, who had been an Illinois State Trooper and still was, would sit in there and do traffic reports. Well, Walter Jacobson, some of you recall, he was at Channel 32 at the time, and he did a commentary. Why? Why are we paying to have an Illinois State Trooper doing reports for a radio station. Why? And that was the end of having a trooper in the window. Actually, uh, Link, Link did a lot of things. Uh, he, he wound up going back to the state police. And one night, I'm coming out the Eisenhower Expressway, and it was bumper to bumper, just crawling. I mean, we were stopped. And I could see some activity up here on the right-hand shoulder. And I'm in the right-hand lane. And I could see it was a, an unmarked car. And here was a perp with his arms up on top of the car and there were two plainclothes officers and I got up there and I looked and there was Link and I had my window down I said hey Trooper Link and he, he said Max Max and he came over to the car and, and, and shook my hand I said hey you better get back over there he said my buddy's got him taken care of <laughs> so we were stopped in the traffic on the Eisenhower to the, my last encounter with Link I, I think he went to, I thought he went to Mexico to open a restaurant I'm a little foggy on that but, uh, yeah, he served out his time with the Illinois State Police, you know, with a pension and, uh, and had a great career there. Uh, we, we got to work with some interesting, uh, interesting characters. He was, he was on duty the day that Spike gave me some of his mustard. Spike O'Dell gave me a spoonful of some mustard that had been sent to him. And I thought, oh, this is probably good stuff. It was extremely hot. I fell out of the chair onto the studio floor. Link came running in. You need mouth to mouth? I said, No, I don't think so. I'm going to get through this somehow. Yeah, we, we had more fun than we were entitled to, that's for sure. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Uh, Steve, Bertrand. Steve Bertrand, of course, the pride of Kankakee County. Yeah, he's done very, very well and uh, he's enjoyed his career there. And uh, yeah, he's, and he's never forgotten his Kankakee County roots, as you can tell. 
Yeah, we've had uh, a lot of folks, a lot of, a lot of personalities develop uh, there at the station. Yes, sir? What happened to Ann Maxfield? That's a good question. Uh, she's, I think she opened a shop to sell jewelry or trinkets of some sort. I, I haven't really followed. Uh, she married a guy in the broadcasting industry, a guy who was managing some stations in town otherwise. And uh, I know she had a family. She was starting a family, but I have not talked to her in quite some time. You just remind me I need to try to reach out and see how she's doing. She was there, of course, during the Bob Collins uh, era. Uncle Bobby was one of a guy. There's a chapter uh, on Bob in the book and a chapter on Wally Phillips in the book as well. Uh, they, uh, they were really remarkable, remarkable people. Uh, back in May, WGN put in a, a plaque there by the Tribune Tower with my name on it, and I, I don't get too excited about that stuff. I, it, you know, it doesn't matter too much to me. And yet, one of the young ladies at the station, the day the plaque was being installed, sent me a photo of the, the guy down on his knees doing the installation, and I noticed the plaque was just to the right of Orion's. And it was between Bob Collins's plaque and Wally Phillips's plaque. And I, I thought, yeah, okay. Then maybe this, is, maybe this is kind of neat for me. I don't know that it matters to anybody else. The other interesting thing, as I pointed out on the air when they were doing that installation, the plaques for Orion and Max are within about 150 yards of where Cyrus McCormick built his first reaper plant. When Cyrus moved from Virginia to build a, a, a reaper plant in the Midwest, he put it right on the Chicago River. When you look at the descriptions of it, the physical description is the north side of the Chicago River, just east of the Michigan Avenue Bridge. Well, that's right smack dab there by the Equitable Building, across from Pioneer Court, where these, these plaques are that, you know, they've sold the Tribune Tower. Our plaques are probably going to wind up, and I'll be doing some dumpster digging in a couple of years to, to get mine out of there. But if you walk by there and you look at that thing, wipe the pigeon poo off of there, would you, just to keep it shining a little bit. But yeah, Cyrus McCormick came, you know, to Chicago, and if you look back at the history of what he did, some of what he was able to develop was enhanced by the fact that he had slaves working for him who certainly had an interest in making the harvest of grain easier and bringing some mechanics into the process. And it wasn't just the fact that he built this plant for manufacturing. He also built the marketing network and uh, put a price on it and established a dealer network out there to sell it. So it was, it was really groundbreaking in a number of ways. And, of course, the fact that that was the start of the red equipment line, and both Orion and I grew up on that kind of tractors. Yeah, that's kind of a, a fun connection. I had my old farm all down there on a Sunday morning a few years ago for a photo shoot. And uh, it, it, was, it was so much fun. A guy from the classic tractor calendar had contacted me. And he said, I'd like to have your tractor, your dad's old Super H, on the calendar. And I said, well, you know, International Harvester was headquartered on Michigan Avenue for about 80 years. And one of those locations was 401 North Michigan, the Equitable Building, right next to 435 where our studios were located. I said, if I could get it downtown, would that be okay? And he said, oh, man, that would be swell. So there was a police officer who would loaf around in our office. He would come in just to sit down and chat with Orion and myself. It was, it was kind of neat. We had a lot of good loafers who would come in. I can share stories about a couple of other guys. But this cop would come in. At this point in his career, he was off the street details, but his job was to close down the expressways when the president came to town or to close down streets for movie shoots. You know, he was to orchestrate that with the various districts of the Chicago Police Department so everything would be fluid. So I thought, well, maybe I should ask him if it's possible I said, can I possibly bring my tractor downtown? How many permits would it take? What would it cost, you know, to do it early on a Sunday morning? He got up out of his chair and he said, ah, when you know somebody, said, that's no problem at all. He walked out of the office. I knew what that meant back in those days. I put a $100 bill in an envelope and sent it to his house. <laughs> and he called me and he said, uh, I don't know what this piece of mail is all about. But Sunday morning at 0500 hours, you'll be met in front of the Wrigley Building by two officers. They're yours for three hours. Click. <laughs> and it worked. That's how it worked. Sure enough, we unloaded. We got down there with the farm all on the trailer. And there were two, two officers in uniform. And I said, you know, Kenny said to take it up there on that cab turnaround because the sun will come up over the lake. And they said, all right, let's go. Then we got up there and unloaded it. 
And I said, you know, I'd really like to get some pictures down in front of the Tribune Tower, in front of our studio. Could I take it down there? And they said, hey, you're in charge till we're done here. Let's go. So one drove across in front of me over the Michigan Avenue Bridge, and the other one was behind me, driving that old farm all across the Michigan Avenue Bridge, Dad's old tractor, right alongside where Cyrus had had his manufacturing plant. So, yeah, uh, my dad, before he passed, got to see me do some strange things with that old farm all that he never envisioned would, uh, would be possible. Bill? Oh, really? Flash Gordon's girlfriend? I do not remember that at all. There was, there was something always interesting going on in a Wally studio. I mean, he had a huge audience in the morning. If you put together the second and third rated stations, at the, which at the time would have been WBBM and WLS, you still didn't have his ratings numbers in the mid-70s. It was such a, such a huge audience. But he made it feel like a small town. He really did. You felt like Chicago was a small community because he really brought everybody together and talked about things in a small town way. In fact, I, I've talked to some local broadcasters in smaller markets who said we kind of copied what Wally did because it was a, really a family feel. And I think that's one thing that, you know, really has, has been gratifying to me over the years. People felt like they were our family. And, and they were really kind of a, a part of our family, too, because they shared so much of what was going on in our families. You know, if you were having a great day, everybody knew that. If there was some kind of a tragedy in your family, everybody in the audience shared it. And it was a very, very, very special, very unique place to be because of that. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, and you know what is interesting is people still remember a lot of that. About six weeks ago, I'm going through Midway Airport, and I'm, I'm coming up to the TSA desk. Now, granted, I go through Midway a lot, but there are a lot of different agents who work TSA there. I come up to the desk, and I put my driver's license up there, and the guy looked at my driver's license. He was, you know, you make this, this quick decision. You know, you, you, you kind of stereotype and looked at him, and I thought he looked like a gentleman of Hispanic descent, about mm, 55, 60 years old. He looked at my license and looked up to me, and he said, you know, I've always enjoyed you with Wally Phillips and Bob Collins. Now, Wally has been gone for over eight years, Bob has been gone for 16. They were so good. They connected so well with their audience that here's a guy all of these years later sees me, didn't pass a second before he said, I enjoyed you with those guys. And I thought, you know, one more reminder to me of how blessed, how fortunate I was to be able to share a studio with those guys who who connected with so many lives in such a, a very special way. Anybody else have a memory or a question? Yes, ma'am. Roy Ah, uh, Roy. Oh, from Morgan County, huh? Yeah. One of his boys did go there, and I can't remember which one. They, their names all started with a hard C or a K. Yeah, there's Colin and Kyle, and, and of course, Bob Collins always made jokes about that. You know, there's Carpy, and, you know, but... Uh, Roy was a tremendous family man, and he always talked about his family. And yes, one of the boys went to, what is that, Illinois Central? Uh, uh, Illinois State's at normal. Illinois College, yeah. And then one of the boys went to Western Michigan. No, Roy passed, uh, I want to say, about four years ago. Well, what was interesting, he was very active on Facebook and in the social media up until about a month before he passed away. I remember he, he had some kind of an inter interaction with me on Facebook. And then I noticed his account was silent. You know, I hadn't heard anything from him, hadn't seen any interaction, and, and he passed shortly thereafter. But uh, a great guy. You know, Orion and I would interrupt his show. We'd come in to do a market report, and it was a colossal interruption. He would be in the midst of an interview with, uh, oh, Lord knows who. I mean, he had everybody in there. And he would always take the time to introduce you to whomever the guest was. Uh, I remember John Denver was in there, and his wife at the time, Annie, was sitting on the couch behind, and Roy introduced me to both of them. I never sought an autograph from anybody until Burt Reynolds was in one day, and I, <laughs> I thought that would impress my wife to be. Linda and I were getting ready to get married, so I... I asked for the autograph, and Bert was very generous, and I took it to Linda, and she said, who's Bernie Reynolds? <laughs> I never asked for another autograph since then. 
Yeah, Bonnie, be sure and remind her about that. She'll probably have more to the story when you talk to her. Anybody else with a comment or question? Yes, sir. Oh, Dr. Milt Rosenberg. No, he is not. Uh, I think Milt is doing some podcasts. The last I heard, he was doing some things, some interviews yet that were available on the Internet. But you talk about a brilliant guy, Dr. Milt Rosenberg. Uh, and, you know, what was really magic for me, being so into radio, I would be out speaking somewhere at night, you know, Tiscola or Tuscola or Tetopolis, you know, coming back, and, and at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, and you're in the dark, and that signal's coming through from, from Chicago, and you're listening to Milt, you know, talk about some of the most detailed and involved and complex political matters, scientific matters. He really broadened his interest in later years as management prompted him to do so. But his guests were so good, they were so knowledgeable, and he asked superb questions. He was a superior interviewer. Um, very liberal back in the 70s. Very liberal, I remember. But he changed. His politics started to shift. A couple of heart attacks and the accumulation of some wealth, and he started to shift a little bit. Uh, but, but Milt was, uh, was a great talent. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about somebody else who was there uh, back during those years, uh, Eddie Schwartz. Some of you listen to the radio late at night. You know, Eddie was a very large gentleman. I mean, he weighed probably close to 600 pounds. And, and at night when he was on the air, there was no other game in town in Chicago radio. He was live and connecting with everything that was going on. Uh, he connected so well with the cops and, and uh, the firefighters. And uh, he'd have a food drive every year, and it was always the coldest night of the year. It would be invariably be 25 below zero. And one year we're having that food drive. We're outside the, the portico there up at Bradley Place where the television station still is. And people would drive up that little U drive, and we'd have... People on the air, we were live, and people calling in from all over the Midwest, the eastern half of the United States. It was really neat. It was a fun thing. It really kind of warmed you up toward the holidays. You'd see people driving up that lane in a Mercedes, and they'd hand you a C-note or a couple of them. The vehicle behind them would be a shabby old Volkswagen. It was just rattle trap, and you thought, man, they're not going to get out of the drive with this thing. And this family, it was all packed in there. They'd hand you a bag of groceries. You knew they could ill afford it. It was just a neat way to come into the holiday season. Well, one of those cold nights at 2 o'clock in the morning, this guy rides up on a bicycle with a ski mask on. And he was standing around the cash box. And people were starting to get nervous about this because he's, you know, he's just kind of, I don't know, it's cold. And you know, everybody's thinking, what's he up to? Finally, a couple of the cops went over and they asked him to take his ski mask off. It was a kid, 12 years old, who had slipped out of his mom and dad's house about a mile and a half north of the WGN studios, filled a backpack with a bunch of canned goods that he took out of the cupboard to bring him down to the food drive in 20 below temperatures. And uh, the police officers put his bike in the squad roll, put him in, the, and they came back and they said, we think we snug him back in. <laughs> So it's just one of those neat things, fun things that you never expected to see and that really contributed to our time there at the station. Any other memories or comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, how do you get the message out as a farmer? It's, it's a challenge. I am encouraged, though, to, to tell you the truth, because of young people, you know, 22-year-olds, 25-year-olds out on the farm who are very passionate in their tweeting, their Facebook posts, over the next few weeks, I'll follow the harvest day by day because of what's being posted by farmers. And as they do so, they're not just putting pictures out there. Many of them are explaining what's going on on the farm. There are some farm women who blog. They blog very aggressively, and they have a lot of followers in the cities. And they interact with other bloggers, you know, uh, blogging mothers in Chicago, who, who, as it turns out, have a lot of followers via the Internet. Uh, I think that's, that's one channel that I see that I'm encouraged about, quite frankly. I think sometimes young farmers who are active in the social media have to remember to back off a little bit. You know, there's a tendency when there's somebody spewing absolute nonsense about your business, you, you get mad about it and you want to retaliate. You want to, you know, really get forceful. And sometimes you just have to count to 10 a little bit. That's probably good advice anytime you're involved in emailing or social media. 
First of all, don't do it if you've been imbibing a little bit and, and you're mad. But, you know, count to 10, think about it. What's a good answer? Appreciate their role, how they're looking at something, and then respond. You know, I don't know that I answered your question totally. You know, Orion was the guy who really started that, who really said, you know, we need to be talking to the consumer. And he, he was doing this 50 years ago, back in the early 60s, when he was explaining agricultural issues to the non-farming audience. And he was really the pioneer in that. And then, hey, a few years ago, we realized that all of us in agriculture need to be involved in helping tell the story. You know, a real important audience for, for all of us who are passionate about agriculture is those people on Capitol Hill and those people in Springfield uh, to really let them know how we feel about things. And I think a lot of us get turned off with the political process, you know, that we watch what's going on on a daily basis. There's too much news. Probably, it could be argued, because of the proliferation of news sources and the 24-hour news cycle. That's probably heresy for a broadcast guy to say that there's too much news. But in actuality, I think it, it, there, there's so much chatter in the communication line that it makes it very difficult you know, to get that accurate story out there sometimes. But we need to remember that those who write the laws and the young people who work on their staffs, those gatekeepers... You know, when you elect somebody to Congress, there's a whole level of people underneath them that you need to get through to get your message in there. But when you communicate with a concise letter, bullet points, examples of how you're affected by something, what this law could cost you, it gives them some kind of ammunition. And if you're not doing it, if you're not communicating with them, they're only hearing from the nuts. I mean, they're only hearing from the extremists, those who have a, an ax to grind, those who are opposed to what we're doing in the agriculture industry, the animal rights activists who just go overboard, and, and they're not familiar with the kind of care that is provided with, with the swine today and modern hog operations and, uh, and the poultry as well. So I, I don't know that I answered your question. It's not, there's not an easy answer to the question. Uh, I've often said we need a truth squad in agriculture. We need to identify some actors and actresses and, and athletes who really have their act together, and there are some, uh, you know, who can really help tell agriculture's story out there. But it's, uh, those are, are hard to identify, and, and it's, it's a difficult challenge. But we, uh, we have to keep at it, I guess, in agriculture is what I'm saying. Yes, ma'am. Have I been to any mega farms for, for animals? Yeah, I've been to a number of them. You know, it's always a concern because of the concentration of the numbers that they have and ha how they handle the nutrients, you know, that come out of there. And, and they're not all created equal. That's an important thing to remember. You have problems in the realty profession. You have problems among teachers, car dealers, broadcasters, for heaven's sake. And there are bad actors in agriculture. And, and the, the pork industry, for example, is trying to get some of those people out of the picture. I've been on hog farms, for example, in North Carolina and in, in Minnesota and Iowa, where you're standing next to the hogs and you don't even know it because they have set it up with the kind of ventilation. They handle the air coming out of there. They handle the waste. They work hard at it, but they're doing it so well that it is environmentally friendly. Conversely, you know, there's a, there's a hog operation I think about down in southern Indiana, and you can smell it for seven or eight miles when the wind is coming out of the, the, right, the wrong direction. Uh, so, you know, it's a challenge. It really is. Uh, we need those economies of scale to continue to be able to produce the food that we need. Long gone are those little, little hog operations of 50 hogs out back. And guess what? Those weren't very humane. It's all we had back in the day, but the hogs were out there and, you know, and... and 25 below temperatures. You know, I, driving into city and in, into downtown Chicago at 4 o'clock in the morning, I would go down Lower Wacker Drive. And that back in those days, I called it the home to the homeless in Chicago. I think Mayor Daley finally flushed most of them out before the Democratic National Convention came to town one, one year. But you'd drive down through there on one of the coldest mornings in January, and you'd see a guy hovered over a barrel. And it always occurred to me, you know, on that, on that same morning, you had baby pigs in Kankakee County or, or over in, in uh, northern Indiana, in Jasper County, or out on uh, Eldon Gould's farm in Kane County. They were in there nice and toasty at 75 degrees. Now, who's 
being better taken care of here. I, uh, Bob Collins was a little hard on me one morning after an encounter I had with a homeless guy. I was coming into the gate there behind the Tribune Tower. There was a parking lot there, and you would take your card, you'd put it over the reader, and the gate would go up. One morning, I pulled an in there. I'm a little bit late, running behind. Here's a guy leaning over a trash barrel, picking through the barrel at 4 a.m. I said, hey, what are you doing? You know, being as patient as I am, he looked up, picked up his bag, and shuffled off into the shadows. And as he did so, I heard him say, in the most distinct and eloquent sentence you could imagine, I apologize, sir. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to block your path this morning. Well, that wasn't what I was expecting to hear. And you know, it really prompted me to think, you know, who was this? Whose son was this? Whose father, perhaps, was it? What, what brought this guy to this point in his life where he's picking through the garbage behind some of the most expensive real estate in the city of Chicago. And I guess I never quite looked at the homeless the same way after that. You know, what was his problem that brought him here to this point in his life? I got upstairs and the mistake I made was sharing the story with Bob Collins because he never stopped ribbing me about beating up on the homeless guy out near the parking lot, as he put it, beating up on the homeless guy. How are we doing on time? Should I shut up? I don't either. Uh, it's uh, about uh, seven minutes till eight central time on WGN, radio home of millions throughout mid-America. <laughs> Two more questions? Okay. Yeah, I got to get it carried away sometimes. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Franklin McCormick. He was from WGN. He actually died. He had a heart attack on the air and died not long after being in the studio on a Saturday morning in 1970, I believe it was. And uh, his voice was amazing. Franklin McCormick, in fact, he, was, he would read poetry, and he would do this between musical selections. And the security guards out there at WGN Studios said they would have these women coming up to the door, and they'd want to get inside to get to Franklin. <laughs> and they'd try to run past the, the doors and, and, and get up there to see Franklin. But he had, a, he had an amazing delivery. There's a funny blooper about Franklin McCormick where he got the hiccups during a beer commercial. <laughs> and uh, there's some great bloopers circulating around out there. It, uh, yeah, I don't think there are any of mine, of course. I wouldn't have any of those, but yeah. My, my predecessor, Bill Mason, uh, had, a, had a pretty good blooper. He was, uh, he was reading, it was, a, it was a Walgreens spot for pantyhose. And... Uh, he, he struggled with the word, <laughs> he struggled with the word gyne gynecological. And he said, well, everyone knows that's genealogical. <laughs> and that was the key, you know, if you made a mistake, you know, just go on. Don't stop and try to correct it. Just keep on, kid. That's what they always told me. Dick, did you have your hand up there? Any comments on Mr. Arms? There is a... Uh, there is a chapter in my book about Darius Harms. I write, you know, there, there's some things we wrote in there about farmers as well, and uh, Darius was one down in Champaign County who was just an amazing guy. He touched a lot of lives. Uh, he touched so many that uh, when his funeral was held, there were people who were there either for the visitation or funeral from England, from Australia, both of whom flew in specially for that event. There was a couple there from Belgium. Uh, he... This is a guy who never touched a computer. He wouldn't know how to text. He didn't know how to send an email or uh, any of that. I, I gave him an iPad about four Christmases ago. That thing got, gathered cobwebs. It had, it had moss growing on it because he didn't touch it. And yet he was masterful in personal communication, in one-on-one -on -one communication and reaching out to people and asking them to do things. And guess what? You couldn't turn him down. Uh, he, he put together the half century of progress with the help of a lot of people, the big event that we have every other year down at the old air base at Rantoul. And uh, it was because Darius could pull these strings. He knew so many people. He had so many phone numbers tucked away in his head. One of the favorite stories that I shared with Steve and Diane a little while ago 
We were sitting down at this show down in Champaign County, this antique farm equipment show, and the guy comes up. To, I'm, I'm sitting in the passenger seat. Darius is behind the steering wheel. And a guy comes up to my side of the pickup truck, and he motions to roll the window down. He's looking straight over at Darius. He's standing on my side of the vehicle, looking straight at Darius, and he says, have you seen that Max Armstrong? <laughs> well, Darius paused a little bit, looked back at him, and he said, yeah, I think he was up there at the lemonade stand a while ago. The guy said, thank you very much. You know, I watch him on the air every week, and I just wanted to say hello to him. <laughs> the guy was 18 inches from me. And in, until the last weeks of his life, Darius was always saying, have you been up to the lemonade stand lately? <laughs> he would not let stuff like that lie. He was always nudging you about something. And, and there's something pretty neat about that. I, that's why I've kind of really been excited about the old equipment. A couple of reasons that I get involved with the old equipment. One of those is the fact that it reminds us how far we've come. The giant strides that we've made. Uh, I don't know if you saw any of this in the media last week, but Case IH came out with an autonomous tractor that they were talking about that drives itself through the field without a driver. Actually, they had me do the voiceover for the video. If you do a search on the web, look for the full version of the autonomous tractor video, CNH Industrial. Uh, they flew a woman in from London, and I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement to voice this video, but it, it, it's, it's really interesting to watch. And it's a concept tractor. It's not here and now. It's not ready to go to the field. It's a concept to show the kind of technology that is being brought to bear in agriculture that allows producers, you know, at, at harvest time to be in the cab and use that cab as an office as they're working there. Younger farmers can send messages on social media or they can order crop inputs, they can direct trucks around. But it reminds us, these old tractors, of how we would be starving if we had to rely on those old machines for the productivity to grow our crops. It reminds me of how far we've come. The other thing, though, is the people that you find. You know, and I, and I, I say that very seriously. I've learned so much from people like you know, Dick Marcotte and, and Bonnie with the wisdom of having farmed for many years and they participate in the old equipment like Darius did. I learned so much from Darius Harms, the farmer that I, I write about in the book. Uh, and, and the knowledge, you know, I worry about some of this knowledge getting away. I wish I'd ask him a lot more you know, back in the day, especially about his Uncle Ed's quotes, which were always on the profane side. But I told Darius he needed to put a compilation of those together, but he didn't. But I think that's the thing that really comes back to me, uh, you know, uh, why I really appreciate the old tractors so much. Young man? Yeah, well, you think I want to tell that? I mean, <laughs> embarrassing myself on the air. Uh, yeah, you know, you just, I try to block those out. Uh, there were those times, and usually, and quite often, they, Bob Collins was involved because he would, he would set my script on fire. Uh, and he, <laughs> In his briefcase that he brought to the studio, he always had what he called a medical journal, complete with photographs, if you get the drift. And he would, he would throw that over in front of you while you're doing your broadcasting. I was, so glad, I was so glad to see Mr. Skilling come on board because that started to deflect a little bit of the attention away from me. Bob started picking on Tommy, and Tommy didn't take it well either. I mean, this was, this was what he did for a living. You know, he's a scientist. And, and of course, the more you reacted to the negative side, the more it encouraged Bob Collins. And so, yeah, you never knew what you were going to get. One more? One more. One more. All in and all done? Yes. Steve and Johnny? Yeah, you know, they're uh, retired, but you hear them back on the radio from time to time. They'll come in during a holiday, holiday work on the station. And, uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're an amazing couple because, you know, they worked together, they lived together, played together, and they still didn't get on each other's nerves. And... And, uh, you know, quite a, quite a compendium of knowledge of uh, movies and theater. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're great folks. I feel very fortunate to have worked with them. You know, Steve was an old rock and roll jock. He worked over at the uh, WLS. And, and uh, it's kind of neat. I get to interact with some of those people, that, uh, you know, who worked at other stations from time to time. Uh, uh, John Landecker, who had a book of his own. John Records was... Records really was my middle name, Landecker, and he was true. His, his grandfather was a guy named Records who farmed down in Indiana, south central Indiana. And uh, John is 
still doing some fill-in on the radio at times, lives as a farm over in western Michigan he lives on. So yeah, there are a lot of great people in the broadcasting industry that we've been so blessed to, to work with. One place I never did work and always wanted to was WLS. But I, I think my voice has been heard there a couple of times on commercials. And, and I think I've even recorded a couple in recent days that might pop up there. Paid political announcements. All right, I better shut up. Pull the plug. If you just tuned in, you just missed it. As they well, say. Hopefully you're not leaving. Um, we have you go to the back and sign some books. Go so to the back, all Max. All right. And, Thank and you so hi. much. Thank you. I really appreciate the privilege. I just, uh, that's one thing. Anywhere I go in the Midwest, I feel like it's home because there's somebody we know, you know, and there's something pretty neat about that. So uh, thank you. Those of you who've invited us into your homes or your pickup cars or your combine cabs, uh, it, it has meant so much to us. And I hope you understand that we mean that. Thank you.